Welcome everyone. We're very happy to have you here and to join us in this event that we have prepared for you. Uh, this panel, the name is Working Across Borders in the Front Front ED Binational Mega, Mega Region. My name is Adriana Llorenz. I'm the Executive Director of Mexicali EDC. Mexicali EDC is an organization of the government of Mexicali that helps to bring investment into the city. But I'll be your host during the whole presentation and I'll be the moderator of this panel. And I'm going to proceed to explain to you just a little bit what is the main focus of this panel that we have prepared for you. The focus of it, it is on, on visa requirements that both governments, either the United States government and the Mexican government have prepared for, for visas uh, for working and professionals to join the cross-border working workforce. Ahora en español, mi nombre es Adriana Llorenz, muchísimo gusto. Represento la organización de Mexicali EDC, que es una organización del gobierno de Mexicali que permite traer inversión nacional y extranjera a la ciudad. En este, en este momento estoy siendo host y voy a ser moderadora de este panel que es enfocado en encontrar oportunidades laborales para profesionistas estadounidenses y profesionistas mexicanos que estén interesados en aprender sobre los requisitos de visas que existen en, las dos, en los dos países. Now, I'm going to proceed to describe a little bit more about the format. So each of the panelists that we have, we're, uh, they're going to address their presentation with their preferred languages. But if you can see right on the bottom, you have the option of this uh, global, uh, uh, the, the interpretation bottom, and you can choose your preferred language. You can either choose Spanish or English, and it, simultaneously, you're going to have the interpretation in it. It will be right on time as we speak in. En, en, al final de la pantalla puedes encontrar este pequeño globo que se llama interpretation. Puedes seleccionar ustedes su idioma de preferencia, ya sea español o inglés, para que mientras están los participantes eh, abordando sus temas, tú puedas seleccionar el idioma que, que prefieras. Más o menos del tiempo en el que cada participante tiene será alrededor de 20 minutos en donde podrán abordar eh, las, las principales oportunidades de las visas. It will be around 20 minutes where each of the participants will address the main uh, visa requirements for both of, 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 of the countries, either the United States and Mexico. And in a nutshell, that, that is, that is the, the rules of this program. And I'm going to proceed uh, to present uh, my, uh, my fellow friend, uh, Alejandro Figueroa. He's gonna give the welcome remarks to this panel. Alejandro, take it away. Thank you, Adriana. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alejandro Figueroa, I'm Yuma County's Economic Development and Intergovernmental Affairs Director. And I'm also the leader of the Forefront TD uh, Education Committee. So on behalf of Yuma County and Forefront TD, I would like to welcome uh, you to today's program titled Working Across Borders in the Forefront TD by National Mega Region. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our two extraordinary uh, panelists, Council General Tiedebach and, our, and Council Larios, who will be talking today about the different visas tailored uh, for highly skilled professionals who would like to explore the possibility of being part of a growing cross-border workforce. I would also like to thank each one of you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us. And if I may, I would highly encourage you to make the most out of this event by engaging in a productive dialogue with our panelists. You know, while it may seem counterintuitive, it is true that the world's economy keeps moving toward automation. Nevertheless, having a highly skilled labor force in our region remains key to economic competitiveness. The forefront EV by National Mega Region, if it is to remain competitive, We'll have to come together to meet labor demands in the science, technology, engineering, and math fields, and jointly produce a binational, bilingual, and bicultural workforce that will take us to the next level in the coming years. Thank you all once again, and I will turn it back now to Adriana to continue with the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro. And just to give a, a final note on the procedure, once uh, the both panelists finish their presentation, we're gonna have a Q&A session that is gonna take about 20 minutes. Um, just to address, uh, you, can, you can put your, your questions right now and write it as we're speaking. We're gonna address it on the final notes, but uh, you can think through the presentation about your questions. 
And just to keep in mind, it will be addressed on the general basis, not in a specific way, uh, if it's something related to, to, uh, to a specific program for you or your family, it, it will be addressed the questions on the general basis. Nada más, eh, dando un poco de recap, ahora procederemos a las presentaciones de, de los cónsules. Eh, al final tendremos el proceso de preguntas y respuestas. Pueden irlas pensando mientras cada una exposición de los cónsules eh, se va desenvolviendo y las pueden escribir en, en, el, en el botón de Q&A para irlas teniendo. Solo recordándoles, eh, va a ser... Eh, las preguntas tomadas de una forma general, algo que les pueda a, a, aportar. Eh, no nos iremos a los específicos por cuestión de tiempo, pero al final tendrán los contactos de los consulados para que puedan dirigirse con ellos. Thank you very much. And I'm going to proceed uh, with such an honor to have you over here, uh, Consul General Laura Biederbeck. I'm going to proceed reading a little bit about your bio. Uh, so you can learn more about, about our personality that we have over here that we're very happy to have. Laura Biederbeck is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service in the United States Department of State since 2002. She began her tenure as the Consul General for the U.S. Consulate in Nogales, Mexico in August 2020. What a year. Prior to returning to Mexico, she served as, as the Deputy Consul General of the U.S. Embassy in Paris, France, where she was responsible for the services to the US citizens. She directed emergency consular responses and crisis management, covering the 4 million annual US citizen visitors and residents in France. Previously, she was the chief of the visa section of the US Consulate General in Tijuana, Mexico. She has also served as a consular officer in Guatemala and Philippines. In Washington, Laura has worked in various policy and management issues. She has led the hierarchy in Afghan special immigrant visa programs and managed global consular staffing and foreign services assignment for consular officers. She earned a bachelor degree in political science from the University of California in Los Angeles. Laura speaks Spanish and French. General Counsel Biederbeck, the floor is all yours. Muchas gracias, Ariana. Thank you so much for that um, introduction. Good morning to everybody. Uh, muy buenos días a todos y, y, todos y uh, todas y gracias por su participación uh, esta mañana. Um, I'm going to speak in English since we have uh, interpretation and it's a little bit easier uh, for me. Um, but I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, join this um, uh, this great uh, event this morning. And of course, it is always my distinguished pleasure to join my uh, colleague and co-panelist, uh, Consul Lario. So, buenos dias, uh, Consul. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, thank you uh, to, the, uh, to Alejandro Figueroa, the Director of Economic Development and Intergovernmental Affairs for Yuma County, um, and also to um, the uh, Forefront ED Executive Director, Nazar Mendes, for this invitation to participate. As, um, as Ariana mentioned, um, I do have, uh, this is my second uh, time to serve the US government here on the US-Mexico border. Um, I was previously, uh, from 2010 to 2013, I was the Chief of Visa Services in the U.S. Consulate General in, in Tijuana. Um, so I am very familiar with this region and I am um, familiar with the um, subject, subject matter that we will talk about today. Um, but I do have a colleague who has joined me today from our visa section to assist with any um, questions that I might not be able to answer in the question and answer. If we could go to the next slide. I want to first start by mentioning to everyone that on December 12th, 2020, and just 22, excuse me, in just a couple of months, the United States and Mexico will commemorate the 200th anniversary, the bicentennial of diplomatic relations between our two countries. And this is a very important year coming up for us to celebrate not only our history and the important history in our border region, but also the future and the future of economic development between our two countries and particularly in our region here in the western portion of the border. 
So it's important for us to reflect on the past, but also to look forward. And I think that that is what uh, today is all about, looking at how we can work together on economic development in our region and specifically for working professionals. If we could go to the next slide. Um, the objectives for today, um, I want to um, share with you information about the classes of non-immigrant visas um, that are available for professionals and to provide you with an understanding of the basic requirements for each visa classification. Um, we're going to cover four main visa classifications as we go through that are specific to, um, specific to professionals. There are other um, worker visas that are available, um, but those are for other categories. So we're going to focus on, um, on our two, uh, excuse me, on our four main uh, classifications. If we could go to the next slide. So if there's only one thing you remember, if there's only one thing that you write down um, from the presentation today, it is our, um, it is our website, travel.state.gov. And that is where we have all of the information on all of our visa classifications. Um, we have dozens of visa classifications for um, various categories. If you go into the search engine and you put in employment travel state, you will come up to our, um, our website. When you get to our travel.state.gov website, you will see the tab for US visas. And this is the um, main place to get information. There's a lot of uh, websites out there. There are a lot of people who want to provide you with visa information um, about working in the United States. I would ask that you just trust the information that comes from our official government website at travel.state.gov. There is actually on this website a tool that allows you to put in information and the system will tell you what classifications are possible based on the criteria that you uh, that you um, that you put into the system? So um, I would highly recommend that um, after we have this presentation today, you take the opportunity to look at our website and look for a little bit more information about um, what it is um, the, the classifications I'm going to talk about today. Um, if we can go uh, to the next slide. This is a summary of the four classifications that are most commonly sought by the community, Arizona and Sonora business communities in our region, same for uh, California and, and Baja California. And I'm gonna go in um, to a little bit more detail on each of these classifications. I should explain that the US consulate in Nogales uh, processes visas just as the U.S. consulate does in Tijuana um, and the other seven consulates that we have. We have our embassy in Mexico City and then nine consuls general, consulates general throughout the country that process visas. The way we organize our visa workload is to make it as efficient as possible. That means that we are able to work or to change workloads or move workloads around between the embassy and the consulates to maximize our resources, to maximize our efficiency, and to process visas as quickly as we can. Which means that um, although I'm presenting to you here from the US consulate in Nogales, if you apply for a TN visa, for example, your interview may occur at a different consulate. We work as a whole mission to meet the uh, visa demand between the United States uh, for our applicants in, in Mexico. If we can go to the, next, um, to the next slide, I'll start talking about the first classification. The TN visa, the NA visa, is unique to Mexico and Canada. Um, it is uh, not offered to citizens of any other country other than Mexico and Canada. And that is based on our trade agreement between the three countries. This is a visa that um, is for uh, professionals specifically. As part of the trade agreement, there is a specific list of professions that are included. And you can see um, we have a link there at the bottom of the slide. Um, again, you can search TN NAFTA professionals to get a link to that, or to, to that list 
to see if you would potentially qualify. You do need employment in the United States and the job, again, must meet the definition of the profession in the treaty uh, that's included in the treaty. These are positions at a managerial level, an executive level, or positions that are requiring specialized knowledge. And the purpose of this visa classification is to ensure exactly what we're talking about today in this presentation, to ensure that workers from um, all three countries are able to um, move as needed to support the economy of, of North America. Um, the making sure I have everything on here. Um, again, this is uh, the applicant must be a citizen of Canada or Mexico. The profession must be on the NAFTA list. Um, it does require to be at a professional level. It does require that there is a prearranged full, uh, full time or part time job from an employer. So there has to be a job. You cannot use a TN visa to go look for a job. You have to have the um, proof of the employment is part of the required documentation. And it's important to note that with this classification under the treaty, self-employment is not permitted. So you do have to have an employer in the United States. So I would encourage everyone to, um, to look at the list of professionals or again, additional details on our website um, for more information on this classification. If we can go to the next, we'll talk about our uh, L visas. L visas are for, um, for employees who work for international companies, companies which have a branch um, who are employed outside of the United States for a company in the United States and need to be transferred. Um, we see these here in the border region with some of our um, uh, some of our um, um, maquilas, for example, where employees are moved from one side to another um, for to work for the, um, uh, the the subsidiary or the parent company in the United States. Again, um, L visas are for managerial or executive um, employees of the company, and they do or in a, in a position that is requiring specialized knowledge. The L visa, along with the two, uh, with the H visa, which I will talk about in just a moment, um, do require a petition by the employer in the United States filed with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services first. In order to apply for the visa, you must have an approved petition. So the employer must file that petition. That's different from the TN visa, which I just talked about, which does not require a petition. It just requires proof of employment for that US-based company. So for our L visas, it is required that you have that petition already approved. If we can go on to the next slide. We'll talk about our H-1 visa, specifically our H-1 visa. Like the L, this does require um, that the employer in the United States file a petition uh, that must be approved by U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services first. Um, and with that approved petition, the applicant in Mexico can, provide, can apply for the H-1 visa. The H-1B visa applies to um, non-residents again, who want to travel to the United States to provide um, services in specialized job categories. Um, so it does require a particular um, knowledge about a, um, uh, in a, in a particular profession and at least one year experience in the applicant's uh, profession. So you have to have um, experience um, in order to apply for this visa. There is a process, as I mentioned, through which this is checked and that is the petition process with USCIS first. There is a cap on the number of H-1B visas that can be issued each year um, that allows, um, uh, so, so sometimes there is, depending on what your nationality is, there could be a little bit of a wait for a visa to become available. Normally with Mexico, however, that is not a problem. Um, so our H-1Bs, the, types of um, professions and the specialties that are um, uh, that qualify for an h1b are very similar 
um, to the um, TN visas, although H-1Bs are a little bit broader because they're not um, restricted by the, um, by the treaty. We'll go on to the next um, slide, please, which is our H-3 visa. This is um, a unique visa for trainees. So this is a temporary, uh, a visa for a temporary worker to come to a business or an organization in the United States to, rece to receive instruction. It's not for internships, it's for actual training or instruction. Again, um, does require a, a petition in order to, um, to qualify, um, but it does not, it does not provide long-term training. I mean, excuse me, long-term employment. It is there for um, uh, usually a shorter period of time uh, for that um, essential training. Again, this process would start with an employer in the United States um, getting the necessary petition approved. If we can go to the next. So one of the most um, often asked questions is, I have a border crossing card already. I have my BCC. Um, I cross all the time. Um, can I work in the United States using just my border crossing card? And in most cases, you, uh, whether or not your business um, qualifies to you, whether or not the border crossing card qualifies for business um, depends on the type of um, engagement that you have in the United States. So I'll give you an example. If you are um, employed by a company in Mexico and your uh, salary is paid by a company in Mexico and you are required to cross the border to go to meetings, to meet with, um, to meet with business contacts, to negotiate contracts, to attend meetings, um, to go for a couple of days to meet with um, senior managers, et cetera, you can do that on your border crossing card. However, if you're going to be employed in the United States, meaning your employer and your, your pay is coming from the United States, you may not do that on a border crossing card. You're required to have one of the visas that I've already explained. So if you are self-employed, for example, and you wanna grow your business and you're exporting something to the United States and you wanna go meet with um, potential contacts up in the United States, you can do that on your border crossing card. Um, you can go to negotiate that contract. You can go to um, meet with um, potential, but potentially your, um, your company has an affiliate in the United States and you need to go there for a few days of meetings, you can do that on a border with your border crossing card or your B1, B2 visa. Um, but you may not work in the United States using that visa. And it's important that travelers not try to get around this rule. Um, we do have a lot of commuters that go back and forth. And I can tell you that CBP um, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, who are checking your visas upon entry into the United States, are looking very closely for people who are working in the United States who don't have the correct visa classification. So it's important for a long-term ability to travel that you travel on the correct visa classification. Of course, the B-2 visa, which is also included in your border crossing card, that's for your recreational tourists, family, friends, um, going to visit um, and do all of the cross-border travel that we do here in the border region. Um, so when you look at your um, border crossing card, you will see that it is a combined B1 for business, B2 for tourism, um, all in, in one. And I'm sure people are gonna have questions on that. So we'll wait for that for the Q&A. If we can go to the next slide. So how do you uh, apply for a visa? Um, so first and foremost, for the, for the classifications that I mentioned, the L and the H, it starts with a petition in the United States. And again, if you go to our website, travel.state.gov, it includes that information and it walks you through the steps. Once you're ready to apply for your visa, you have that approved petition if it's needed, 
or you are applying for a TN or you need to get your border crossing card, um, the first step is to complete the online visa application form. And I have on here the um, website where you can go and um, uh, 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 complete the application form. For a non-immigrant visa, the form number is DS160. It'll take you through, it's a form filler. It'll take you through and it will um, uh, walk you through all of the questions necessary based on the classification that you've chosen. Something important to remember, you are required to have a valid passport to apply for a visa. Many years ago, um, when I was serving in Tijuana, we made the transition while I was there um, for Mexican citizens applying for a border crossing card, for example, they were required to have a passport. That was a big change because before that time, you were only required to have an identification. Um, it wasn't required to have a passport. Now a passport is required. Um, a Mexican passport is required. Um, so first step, have that valid passport and um, make the application through our, um, our, our website. We can go to the next. Then you're going to pay the fee um, for the application. This is the fee to apply, um, meaning it's not refunded if the visa is not approved. This is an application fee. Um, and for the non-petition based uh, applications, those TNs, the B1, B2 border crossing cards, that fee right now is $160. Petition-based petition categories, our Ls and our Hs, is $190 to apply. Again, um, we provide our, um, we disclose and we publish the list of visa fees on our website, which you can see there on the bottom, date.gov. Um, it's important um, to note what the fees are um, because unfortunately there are people out there who will charge you or tell you um, that it is more um, and will collect the difference. Um, so we'll talk about potential fraud in just a moment, but we are required as the US government to publish our consular fees, all fees that we charge, and that is done on our website. It's also published in all of our consulates. Um, we have it up on, the, up on the wall. If we can go to step three. Step three is getting the appointment. And that is a process, again, it goes through um, uh, our internet site. Um, the first appointment will be with our, um, our applicant service center, Centro de Atención de Solicitantes. And then once you, uh, you will go to that appointment, that's where your photo will be taken, your fingerprints will be collected, your application will be double checked, and then you will be given your appointment at the consulate. Now, the big question, how long does it take to get an appointment at the consulate? I will be completely honest that we are worldwide still trying to catch up from the nearly two years that we needed to suspend visa processing globally due to the pandemic. Um, and we are continuing to open up more appointments, um, taking into consideration, of course, the health and safety of both our applicants and our employees. As I mentioned at the beginning, Mission Mexico, all of our nine consulates and the embassy are working together to maximize our resources, the space that we have in consulates, the employees that we have, to catch up as quickly as we can. We know that the wait time for visas is significant. Um, we do have a process by which you can request an urgent appointment if that's required. We are prioritizing our worker classifications, our students, and uh, those with urgent need to travel for medical or other emergency appointments. So there is a process by which you can request an earlier appoint appointment, and we have a process to, um, to review those cases. But you do need to go through the first three steps that I just covered before you can request an urgent appointment. If we can go to step four. Step four is the interview, and that's where you will come um, in to meet a consular officer. A consular officer will review um, your application 
and ensure that you meet the qualifications for the visa classification and that you do not have any ineligibilities um, to travel to the United States. As I've mentioned a couple of times, this, is a, this, this shows you where we are located. Um, we have our embassy, of course, in Mexico City and our consulates general in Nogales, in Tijuana, Ciudad Juarez, Hermosillo, Guadalajara, Nuevo Laredo, Monterrey, Matamoros, and Merida. So we are located all over the country. And as I mentioned, as we're working to maximize our efficiency, um, your interview could be scheduled at, um, at another consulate. What we have tried to do, for example, is to ensure that in each region, we can process all classifications. So if you're in Mexicali or if you're in Nogales, um, your appointment is not going to be in Matamoros, right? It'll probably be between Tijuana, Nogales, Hermosillo, maybe Ciudad Juarez. Ciudad Juarez is the post that processes all of our immigrant cases, all of our immigrant visa applications. So again, we're trying to maximize our resources so that we can get everyone, um, everyone through um, and continue to ensure that the uh, workers and the, um, the, 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 the business can continue um, in spite of the challenges that we have as a result of the, of the pandemic. If we can go to the next slide. Always my recommendations. Um, there are worldwide, um, this is not unique to Mexico at all. Um, as Adriana pointed out, I've served in Guatemala, I've served in the Philippines, I've served in Mexico, I've served in Europe. Um, and there are always people there waiting to take advantage. Um, smugglers who will promise the world. Um, people who will tell you, you must have certain documents um, and will charge you uh, for those documents. Um, and I can tell you that if you present false documents to a consular officer um, and you are found to have uh, committed fraud, that is a permanent ineligibility from returning to the United States, from traveling to the United States. The, it is very, very, very serious. Don't do it. Um, our consular officers are well-trained um, and they know what to look for. Um, so present your case and present the documents that we note in the application that are required. And please don't give your personal documents to other people. Um, again, those documents may be used for purposes that you did not intend them to be used. And suddenly you're involved in a fraud case that you had nothing to do with. So protect your personal documents. Don't use or pay uh, for any false documentation. And above all, don't go to um, smugglers. There are legitimate organizations. There are legitimate companies that may assist you. There are attorneys, immigration attorneys in the United States, which many companies use um, to complete the application and to um, process the application correctly, legitimately, without any trouble. Um, and so uh, particularly if you're working with an employer in the United States, you know, ensure that you're communicating with those with the employer. One note about um, before I close one note about our consular officers and who they are, who are these people um, who are at the window, who will eventually review your application and who will talk to you. Um, they are officers just like me. I'm a consular officer um, by, um, by trade. That's what I've been spending most of my career either doing or managing. Our officers are very well trained. They are trained to know what questions to ask. They are, they are trained in the visa classifications um, that they are adjudicating. As Adriana mentioned um, in my introduction, one of my great privileges was actually to teach our consular officers at our Foreign Service Institute in Washington, DC to receive their commission. All of our consular officers, those that are making visa decisions, uh, receive a commission signed by the Secretary of State and the President of the United States. This is a very serious responsibility that they have, and I can tell you that our officers take it very seriously. Our officers, our foreign service officers who adjudicate visas and work in our embassies and consulates reflect the diversity of the United States of America. 
So if you have a vision in your head of who are what a uh, who a uh, a consular officer what that person should look like, um, I can tell you that our consular our our foreign service officers are as diverse as the United States of America. Um, many, including um, several who have worked um, at our mission here in Mexico are originally from Mexico, for example, and are now United States citizens and proudly serving as foreign service officers. So know that when you come in and your application is reviewed, it's being reviewed by a consular officer who has been trained, who knows what they're looking for, who will ensure that the law is applied fairly and will take um, uh, every consideration to your application. Thank you so much for this opportunity and um, I look forward to answering any questions you have. Thank you very much, Consul General Dirobeck. And I'm gonna move forward with the presenta presentation of our Consul General eh, Mr. Larios. Eh, estamos muy contentos de tenerlo aquí, de escuchar las oportunidades que nos va a dar para para las personas de Estados Unidos que quieren trabajar aquí en, en México. Les cedo la palabra y bienvenido. De, eh, voy gracias. a nada más, si me dan una oportunidad, quiero también leer este, la magnífica participación que ha tenido usted en el gobierno federal en el servicio exterior mexicano. And I'm going to do this presentation of a consul Larios in, in English. Um, since April 30 in 2018, uh, Consul Larios took office in Consul of Mexico in Yuma, Arizona. He had been working as a career dip diplomat for the Mexican Foreign Services since 1985, reaching the rank of minister in 2017. During his career, he has served as head of political affairs at the Embassy of Mexico in Portugal, head of political of commercial affairs at the Embassy in Mexico in Morocco, Consul of Community Affairs at the Consulate General of Mexico in Los Angeles, California, Consul of the Protection Department at the Consul General of Me Mexico in New York, Deputy Consul at the Consul General of Mexico in San Antonio, Texas. Consul Larios Ponce was born in Puebla, Puebla, and he earned a bachelor degree at law at the Benemerita Universidad Autónoma de Puebla in his postgraduate studies in law at the University of Mexico. Consul Larios, le cedo, le cedo la palabra. Muy amable, Adriana. Agradezco mucho su presentación. Eh, es un honor compartir este panel en realidad con, con la cónsul general Biedebach. Muchísimas gracias por organizar este, este panel eh, tan completo. Y desde luego, pues al agradecerle a los organizadores, a Alejandro Figueroa, a Nacer Méndez, por toda esta iniciativa que se han tomado para darnos una perspectiva de las eh, formas en que los, diferentes, los dos países eh, manejamos la parte de divisas. Eh, como bien dijo la cónsul Biedebach, pues estamos eh, celebrando los 200 años de las relaciones entre México y los Estados Unidos y todos los días, todos los días estamos en esta interacción tan intensa, sobre todo aquí en esta frontera. Yo voy a empezar, eh, si me permiten, con la primera lámina, explicando un poco sobre cómo es la normatividad migratoria, eh, si, la, si presenta la primera, la, la primera página, la primera, cómo es la normatividad migratoria en México. La normatividad de nos, de, de, de mexicana es a partir de la ley de migración que está vigente desde el año 2011 y que ha tenido diferentes reformas, las últimas en este año 2022. Lo que busca esta, esta normatividad, esta ley de migración, es sobre todo la preservación de la soberanía y la seguridad nacional de nuestro país. Complementada con eso, si, si pasa a la siguiente diapositiva, está el reglamento de la ley de migración, vigente también desde el año 2012 y con diferentes reformas que ha tenido a lo largo del tiempo para irla adaptando, sobre todo en todo lo relativo a la formulación y dirección de la política migratoria del Estado mexicano. Toda esta normatividad, si pasa a la siguiente lámina, este, está reflejada en los lineamientos generales para la expedición de visas 
que emite la Secretaría de Gobernación y la Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores. En México, la política migratoria descansa en la Secretaría de Gobernación y la aplica la Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores a través de su extensa red consular, sobre todo de México aquí en los Estados Unidos. Eh, así pasa en la siguiente, la siguiente diapositiva. Para los efectos, digamos, que interesan a este panel, esto es la obtención de visas de trabajo para ser parte de una fuerza laboral transfronteriza, digamos que deben, eh, eh, se, se, se clasifican, digamos, en estas categorías, pero son fundamentalmente las visas de visitantes con permiso para realizar actividades remuneradas, cuando es solicitada por oferta de empleo, en no mayor a, ciento, a 180 días, este, no mayor a cuatro años, más bien dicho, y, y este, sí, no mayor a, a, a 180 días. Y la visa de residencia temporal, mayor a 180 días y menor a cuatro años. En estas categorías, eh, repito, la obtención del permiso de trabajo se descansa en el Instituto Nacional de Migración, la Secretaría de la Nación. Eh, para este tipo de, de obtención de visa, este, si pasa a la siguiente lámina, la visa de visitante con permisos para realizar actividades remuneradas eh, solicitada por oferta de empleo o la visa de residencia temporal también con, o, con oferta de empleo no mayor de cuatro días, mayor a, no, mayor a 180 días y no mayor a cuatro años, los requisitos básicos son presentar el pasaporte en original y copia con una vigencia eh, mínima de seis meses, una fotografía, así como el original y copia de los documentos que demuestren que cuenta con una oferta de empleo. Eh, si pasa la siguiente lámina, por favor. Lo mismo sucede con la visa de residencia permanente aplicable a personas extranjeras que pretenden internarse a México en la condición de estancia de residente permanente con oferta de empleo. Y es lo mismo, los requisitos básicos son presentar un pasaporte, fotografía, original y copia del documento que acredite su legal estancia si la persona no es nacional del país donde solicita la visa, y el original y copia de los documentos que demuestren que cuenta con oferta, con oferta de empleo. Ahora bien, eh, la siguiente lámina. Para obtener esta, digamos, eh, eh, esta oferta de empleo para que esté autorizada y nosotros como Red Consular de México en los Estados Unidos podamos proceder a la autorización de las visas, eh, el empleador tendrá que recurrir a un micrositio del Instituto Nacional de Migración de trámites migratorios. Ahí viene reflejada toda la información necesaria para conocer el procedimiento y los requisitos que deben, que deben ingresar a la página del Instituto Nacional de Migración y puedan obtener los empleadores el permiso de trabajo. Ahora bien, para el, si, si pasa a la siguiente lámina, eh, para, para ello el empleador necesita obtener previamente una constancia de inscripción de empleador. ¿Qué, ¿Qué es? Bueno, pues lo que es, es permite al promovente, esto es a las personas físicas y morales, realizar trámites para emitir ofertas de empleo a extranjeros. Eh, esta constancia de inscripción de empleador necesita tener, primero que nada, un formato, si pasa a la siguiente, un formato para solicitar el trámite migratorio llenado electrónico a través de la página de internet del Instituto Nacional de Migración con firma autógrafa del promovente y el promovente debe demostrar documentalmente que es una empresa legalmente constituida y que se encuentra operando. De esa manera nosotros eh, podemos dar inicio al eh, trámite migratorio en la red consular de México en los Estados Unidos. Si, si pasa a la siguiente lámina. La constancia de inscripción del empleador debe de, también de, 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 
contener la inscripción ante el SAT, ante el Instituto Mexicano del Seguro Social, ante el IMSS, debe también eh, com ser completada por una declaración de impuestos, comprobante de domicilio e, ident e identificación del representante legal o persona física con la lista de empleos y la nacionalidad. Eh, eh, además, con esta constancia de inscripción del empleador, eh, la el promovente, ya sea la empresa física o la persona moral, si, si, si pasa a la siguiente página, por favor, presentará un formato de solicitud de visa y los requisitos al ante el Instituto Nacional de Migración. La autoridad migratoria verifica el cumplimiento de los requisitos, así como los antecedentes de la persona extranjera del promovente. Eh, el, el INAMI puede solicitar incluso la opinión de autoridades competentes o bien realizar una de, visita de verificación migratoria para saber si realmente estamos eh, hablando del empleador real y verídico que quiere utilizar los servicios de algún empleado. En esta etapa el INAMI puede o conceder o negar el trámite. Si se detectan inconsistencias en o incumplimiento de los supuestos previstos en el artículo 43 de la ley de migración, el INAM puede, eh, puede negar este, el trámite. Pero en caso de que tenga aprobación, es decir, si se acepta el trámite, la siguiente lámina, por favor. El INAMI notificará al promovente que la persona extranjera interesada puede gestionar entonces una cita para la entrevista consular. Depende de, 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 del domicilio este, eh, de, de, de la persona donde se encuentre, podrá hacer el, el, la cita en alguno de los 50 consulados que México, si pasa a la siguiente, en alguno de los 50 consulados que México tiene en los Estados Unidos, contacta al consulado de México más cercano a su lugar de residencia actual eh, y, y nosotros eh, eh, procedemos a la, eh, a la emisión de la, de la visa previa, la, previa a una entrevista consular que realizamos para determinar si la visa puede ser aprobada o negada y de resultados se informa al Instituto Nacional de Migración. Si pasa a la siguiente, por favor. Eh, eh, este es un ejemplo. Del, eh, de, 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 del permiso que, este, que emite la Secretaría de Gobernación eh, con la información necesaria para eh, determinar eh, si eh, procede la entrevista consular y, eh, y de esa manera cerrar, digamos, eh, el, eh, el trámite entre el Instituto Nacional de Migración este, en México y la red consular en los Estados Unidos. Debe de considerarse que la presentación del visado no garantiza al final del día la internación a territorio nacional. Siempre está eh, condicionada a la aprobación de las autoridades sanitarias y migratorias eh, en el punto de entrada. Este, el día de la cita, la persona extranjera, por supuesto, debe presentar el NUT y cuesta 48 dólares eh, por el examen y la emisión de la visa. Si pasa la siguiente, por favor. Bueno, esto es lo que acabamos de, 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 de señalar. Este, la información adicional que puede solicitar el, el consulado en caso de tener alguna duda se cuenta con 10 días hábiles para autorizar o no la expedición de la visa y con base en la entrevista consular se puede aprobar o negar de acuerdo a las condiciones de cada solicitante y el resultado es eh, informado al INAMI. Siguiente, por favor. <coughs> eh, bueno, es, es, es lo mismo que acabamos de, de explicar. La siguiente. Y bueno, pues estos son los datos del Consulado de México en Yuma, nuestra dirección, nuestro correo electrónico para cualquier duda. 
este, son nuestros teléfonos y nuestro horario. Y estos son los datos también del INAMI eh, con su representación local en San Luis Río Colorado. Pues esto es básicamente lo que yo tendría que, que informar. Muchísimas gracias, Consul, por su valiosa información presentada. Ahora vamos a pasar al tiempo de preguntas y respuestas. Ya tenemos eh, algunas preguntas aquí que han hecho por los asistentes y creo que con la que empezaremos seré, será directamente para la Consul Dirbeck. One of the questions that is over here, uh, they're asking for the visa TN. Is it a requirement to validate if the foreign degree, either Mexican or Canadian degree in the US prior to apply for the TN visa? It's not required to validate the degree. You will bring proof of your degree, um, which we have the ability to verify. Um, so you should bring um, proof of the um, degree along with your transcripts. That'll be one of the required um, documents. And that will be a document that we will verify. But there's no process in the United States to have that verified by a US-based university, for example. That's part of the process with the application. And I will invite my, um, my colleague, um, Hector, who's on the line from the visa section. Hector, if I say anything that's incorrect, please correct me as I'm answering the questions. I want to ensure that our audience has the, um, the, the correct information. Thank you, Consul. Uh, we hear you, Hector. Uh, thank you, Consul. Yes, I will, I will be here. Okay. Thank you. So we have another question for Consul Larios. Consularios, eh, ¿qué otros servicios provee el Consulado de México para profesionistas mexicanos que se encuentran en territorio estadounidense con una visa de trabajo? Bueno, muy interesante la pregunta. Nosotros tenemos una política de acercamiento con toda la comunidad mexicana, desde luego particularmente con toda la gente que viene a trabajar en diferentes sectores. Eh, recordemos que nosotros aquí en, en el área de Yuma, pues recibimos cerca de 7000 trabajadores anualmente, trabajadores H2A, y eh, anualmente, que empieza la, la temporada en, en octubre a marzo, hacemos siempre eh, programas de acercamiento, eh, semana de derechos laborales, y eh, jornadas de información eh, en materia de protección consular, en materia de asistencia y de documentos. De modo que la persona que viene a, a laborar a este lado de la frontera siempre tendrá oportunidad de poder establecer comunicación con los consulados de México en los Estados Unidos. Tenemos también eh, programas de comunidades, de información de salud, información de educación, información financiera y una gama intensa de, de, de servicios incluido desde luego la renovación de sus documentos, pasaportes, matrículas, etc. Así que siempre estamos eh, abiertos a poder establecer comunicación con los trabajadores que vienen a este lado de la frontera. Gracias, Consul. Uh, we have over here a question that apparently is addressed for either both of the, of the consuls. I'm going to read it in English. Uh, do all interviews require in-person attendance, or is there any consideration for mutual meetings for requirement of these types of visa? Uh, whoever wants to address the question, the, the answer, be our guest. For us, most of, uh, well, all first-time applicants are required to have an in-person interview. If you're renewing a visa, um, there may, uh, that interview may be, um, may be waived. Um, but it depends on the classification. At this point, we have not moved um, to virtual interviews. Um, I can tell you, I've been, we've been talking about this in the Department of State um, for a long time, and we'll have to see what happens um, as we're again trying to find um, mechanisms to, um, uh, to, to be able to manage larger number of, of cases that require application. So stay tuned on that. But for now, um, most, uh, well, all first time applicants do require an interview. 
um, there is a mechanism to waive interviews for renewals of um, those who already have um, employment-based visas. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Ponce of Wittebeck. We have another question over here that says, does a Mexican can offer services in the United States but being paid in Mexico? I'm assuming it's a, uh, professional services, but since we don't have more information, um, this is a question. So this is an area where we need to be very, we, we, where we need to be very careful. And um, so uh, it's, there's a lot of hypothetical scenarios with this question. So I can't give a definitive yes or no answer. If you are employed um, by a Mexican company and you need to cross occasionally for again, meetings to work on contracts, um, to provide a day of training, things like that, can be done with a B1, B2 or a border crossing card. Um, you'll want to check the, the scenarios that we provide. And we do provide a, a large number of scenarios on the travel.state.gov website under visas about what you can do in the United States on a, um, on a border crossing card. You can also contact the consulate um, through our public information um, information that we provided if you have specific questions. Um, but it's hard for me to give a definitive answer, but I can tell you on the website, we have a lot of examples. Thank you, Consul. Por consularios, eh, Consul, en términos generales, ¿cuál es el perfil de los profesionistas estadounidenses que solicitan una visa de trabajo al gobierno de México? Bueno, es uh, variado, pero fundamentalmente digamos que se concentra en personal técnico, en ingenieros, eh, en personal como informáticos o expertos en software, que sobre todo en esta zona de Mexicali, este, de Baja California, eh, eh, absorben, absorben mucha eh, mano de obra o eh, conocimiento en esos campos. Y también, eh, curiosamente, en la industria del turismo. Eh, hace poco, por ejemplo, tuvimos eh, la petición de dos buzos que este, iban como instructores a eh, centros turísticos en La Paz y en Ensenada este, para instruir en esa, en esa materia. Digamos que ese es el, eh, un poco el perfil de, este, de, de los ciudadanos americanos que pretenden o desean viajar a nuestro país. Muy bien, muchas gracias, Consul. We have another question over here that it's a little bit general, but um, I'm going to try to be specific. Is it easy to get a visa for working, or do we need an invitation for an employer, employer to apply? I think it is important to specify what type of visa that the Consul Vitebeck uh, gave information, but I guess I'm going to focus on the question of do they need an invitation for, it, for any employer to apply? Yes. So for all of the um, for all of the classifications that I cover, it does require an employer in the United States. If it's um, a TN, it requires a, a letter from the employer confirming that there is a position there. And then again, if it's one of our H's or L's, it requires the employer in the United States to file the petition with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, so yes, that is required. Thank you, Consul. Another question over here. Soy estudiante recién egresado de una universidad en México y deseo buscar trabajo en los Estados Unidos. ¿Quién sería mi primer punto de contacto para poder tramitar un permiso de trabajo si no cuento con constancia de un empleador de Estados Unidos? Um, should I translate the question? But um, because I'm guessing it's for Consul Bideback. I was muted. Adrian, I'm sorry. Can you repeat it one more time? I, I lost connection I, for just I a second. Miss. Yes. Um, uh, and as in, a recently a graduate student from the University of Mexico wishes to apply for a visa in the United States, what would be the first point of contact to tramit the permit of work? 
if it doesn't have a, a, a letter from an employer in the United States. So if, if you are a graduate in Mexico and you're looking for employment um, in the United States, um, my understanding, and, and I will freely admit that I am not on LinkedIn, I'm sorry, I'm one of the few people probably who is not on LinkedIn and I should be, um, but my understanding that um, there is actually a search mechanism in LinkedIn, for example, that can help you find potential employers in the United States. Um, working with organizations like economic development um, offices, um, I think is, is, is helpful in building those contacts in the US. Um, also, um, some of the you know, online job search engines also um, is a mechanism to be able to find potential, um, potential in, in employment on the, on the US side. But I was told most recently by a colleague um, that um, LinkedIn has become a good way to be able to search for those opportunities. Perfect, thank you. Uh, we are on our final uh, five minutes for this Q&A session. We're gonna address, uh, let's say a little bit more than three or four uh, final questions, and then we're gonna wrap it up with the program. But for consularios, uh, one of the questions that we have over here also, eh, ¿nos podría mencionar las ciudades y regiones o regiones en México que concentran la mayor cantidad de profesionistas estadounidenses con una visa de trabajo? Bueno, yo eh, puedo hablar aquí por esta zona, por esta región. Recordemos que México tiene 13 consulados a lo largo de toda la frontera entre México y los Estados Unidos. Y cada peticionario, eh, pues, tiene que eh, acudir al consulado que le quede más cercano conforme a, a su domicilio este, en, todo, en, en todos los Estados Unidos, en los 50 consulados. Pero en cuanto hace a, a nosotros aquí en Yuma, los profesionistas que hemos detectado, eh, eh, ciudadanos americanos que pretenden viajar a, a México, se, contren, se concentran, como decía yo hace un momento, en la zona de Mexicali, cuestiones de carácter técnico, este, en la zona del norte de, de Baja California, y en la parte turística hacia el sur, en La Paz y en Ensenada. Es a donde hemos nosotros este, detectado que vienen profesionistas solicitando sus visas de trabajo para ir a esos lugares. Muchas gracias, Consul. And the, the last questions, I guess it will be for Consul Biederbeck. I'm going to try to translate over here the questions. Um, one person said, uh, if I want to uh, tramit a, a visa permit as a student, and I'm an active uh, student in a faculty in the United States, will I be able to use this document to apply for a job? So if I understand the question correctly, the, 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 um, the person is already in the United States as a student and is looking for um, to be able to stay in the U.S. to work. That's right. Um, okay. Um, in that case, there are a couple of different options for students. Um, there is an opportunity to, um, um, to stay for practical training, for example, as part of a student visa. And then you're, you're, you're in the United States, obviously you have your university and your network of your university, you're in a good position to be able to search for um, an employment opportunity and then move on to an employment-based non-immigrant visa. That is possible and that does happen. Um, what I would encourage you to do is to speak to your international student um, coordinator at your university um, so that you can understand the process for the, um, the, uh, the extra year of practical training if that applies to you and also about um, potential, um, potential transition to employment. That does happen quite frequently all over the world. Um, yeah. And um, there are, there is one classification that I will, just for this particular question, person who asked the question, if you're in the United States studying and you are on a J visa, you may have a requirement to come back to your home country. So I think it's important for that particular person to speak to the um, international student advisor 
there at the university which will who will have the um, technical expertise to answer the question based on the classification that they're using right now. Thank you. Another one of the questions over here, it says, I work at a maquiladora company, which is a company that is located in Mexico and uh, under the, the IMEX program. They require to hire a group of the niche technicians. It probably will be temporary, but we not we don't know uh, for how many time long, and it's going to be for New Jersey. Is there any program for a group of technicians as a group? Some of the classifications can um, can apply to to groups. The one I the one the ones I covered um, are for individuals. Um, the um, it depends on the level of the technicians that you're talking about. This could be something that comes under an H2 category. Again, I would I would refer you to um, the um, the information that we have on our website that breaks down um, the differences between um, the H1 and the H2. Um, it's not impossible to come as a group. It just depends on the visa classification. Thank you. And I'm going to address the last questions, but not less important. It is also for Consul Bideback. If I have a tourist visa and I want to ask for a working visa, does the tourist visa get canceled and I'm no longer be able to use it? Nope. Um, so you can have more than one um, type of visa. Um, and usually the tourist visas, for example, those are valid for 10 years. And so your worker visa may only be for a couple of years. Um, and so it just depends, you know, when you enter the United States, you'll present the visa um, for the purpose of that, of that travel. So no, you can, keep a, um, you can keep a valid tourist visa while you have a, uh, a worker visa um, as, as well. Perfect. Thank you very much for both consuls for, for being very punctual in their answers. I'm going to proceed and give the mic to Nasser. Nasser, give us the, the final remarks for this, this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. On behalf of the 440D Governing Group, I would like to thank Consul Yen and I'll be back and Consul Arius for sharing this important information about visa requirements for professionals who live and work in the US Mexico region. Uh, for the forefront, it is a true honor to facilitate this conversation, especially when our countries are celebrating 200 years of diplomatic relations. Adriana, thank you so much for hosting today's events. You did a great job as always, and you probably represent the new generations of professionals in the border region. A toda nuestra audiencia, Muchas gracias por conectarse con nosotros esta, esta mañana para conocer los requisitos y procedimientos correctos para la obtención de visas enfocadas en profesionistas. Fofornidi tiene como uno de sus objetivos principales dar a conocer herramientas que mejoren las condiciones de vida de su población. Gracias de nuevo a todos y Adriana, te regreso el micrófono. Muchas gracias, Nacer. Voy a dar unas pocas palabras nada más en español, que es mi idioma materno y la mayoría de los que estamos aquí este, hablamos en, en español y en inglés. Eh, les agradecemos a todos, sobre todo al público que se tomó el tiempo de, de escucharnos. El Forum for ID es una de las organizaciones más importantes que tenemos en nuestras cuatro fronteras que cubren California, Baja California, Arizona y la parte de, de, de Sonora. En conjunto se trabaja para dar, como comentó Nacer, mejores oportunidades y una de las cosas que mantenemos en, 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 en relación y que sabemos que es prioridad es el talento y las oportunidades que generemos para nuestro talento son valiosas. Por eso es que hacemos este tipo de esfuerzos. Gracias a todos y esperemos pronto hacer una próxima edición ya en vivo en nuestras ciudades. Nos vemos. Gracias a todos. Buen día. Gracias. Muchas Buen gracias. Día.